uh, his own association and so she will explain uh, her position and I think uh, his status uh, will be both as a moderator and as a speaker because she has also uh, very interesting slides to show. So Marta, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Bertrand, um, and thanks for such a, an exciting program um, thus far. Um, we're going to be talking about the very important topic of newsroom management, because after all, all of the great topics that have been discussed in the last couple of days are great, but without a really great management system and the budget behind it, um, we're, we're going to have a lot of challenges in the future. And speaking of challenges, one of the key challenges that's happening um, around the world, not in every part of the world, but in many places in the world, in, uh, in our newsrooms, is the topic of diminishing budgets. And editors-in-chief uh, and management are faced with the difficult task of having to cut costs, but to still produce great journalism uh, for their marketplaces. And so um, I wanted to start by simply, uh, before I introduce our great speakers, I wanted to introduce a report that our own company has created. It's a nonprofit called the World News Media Network, where we create um, cross-media uh, research for the benefit of the industry in a nonprofit environment. So um, let me just give you a little bit of an overview of this um, this report that has everything to do with uh, the management of, of cross-media companies today, and in particular, having a lot to do with what's going on in our newsrooms. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, we partner uh, in the World News Media Innovation Study every year. This is our third year. Um, we partner with Columbia University in the United States, the University of Central Lancashire in the United Kingdom, and the Norwegian School of Management. And then we also have dozens of partnerships among media um, associations around the world, uh, country associations, regional associations, international associations that help us distribute the survey to get it out to as many people as possible in our industry. And uh, we, we distribute it in nine languages. Um, this year, uh, because we changed the way we did our research, uh, we only had 300 responses, and we're going to change that for next year, of course. We, we're shifting gears a little bit in our, in our uh, research. Um, and the focus, um, the, the key topics are, um, we want to know from your companies um, about your innovations, your plan for innovation, your plan for investment in your company, particularly in the newsroom, cost-cutting across the board in your companies, and then how are you planning to create new channels and new products? And here's what we found. First of all, the people who responded, 25% editors-in-chief, 40% uh, top managers, top executives like publishers and managing directors, and the rest uh, commercial managers like sales and com uh, commercial um, executives and other, including academics and so on. So here's what we found for one of the key questions, because we really wanted to know um, what are your plans uh, for investment in your company? And what we, we found, um, and this has been pretty consistent in the last three years, on the top of the heap for investment, and this is really good news, this is across the board around the world, is the notion of developing journalist skills. Now more than ever, now that, in, especially in this conference, we're learning that we need to learn new skills as the media landscape changes and the demands on our companies are changing rapidly. It's very important to note that companies are way on top of that and are prioritizing developing journalist skills on the top. And the other ones that I've circled here for you, um, just to point to other journalism-related priorities, uh, iPad uh, and tablet development, um, number three position, and then convergence of multimedia um, operations, mobile phone um, operations, and upgrading the content management system, which goes hand in hand with all the things that we've been talking about. And then when you start to talk about cost savings or cost cutting, this is where it gets a little bit um, interesting because th the respondents said over the next 12 months, um, how important are these various tasks and these various uh, priorities uh, in your media company? 
And in, for the third year in a row, the number one answer by a long shot is developing new products. And this is really important because the future of our, of our uh, companies, the future of our industry, really depends on expanding in, into new horizons, new channels, new products. And then after that, streamlining the workflow, making things more efficient, um, investing in new technologies that enable our objectives, and then rapid, rapid implementation of changes, reorganizing our internal operations, collaborating with others on content generation, making partnerships, and then also uh, cooperating with other agencies for product development. Um, and then when we talk about the issue of uh, opportunities for organization over the next five years, the long-range plan, if we can even go that far out, we're asking the respondents, you know, what are your priorities in that regard? And social media development is on the top of the heap. Uh, last year it was mobile development. That has bounced down only because I think social media has become such a hot item right now. Um, and it's really interesting how this survey has evolved over time because in the first year it was more like the development of our websites. Then it became mobile, now it's social media. And I think that you're probably finding the same thing in your own operations. After that, uh, paid for e-reader tablets and products and paid for mobile phone services are in the number two and three positions. And then, uh, I think that this is interesting too because cost reductions, of course, is a really big issue and is key to what we're going to be talking about on this panel today. So what we find the number six position is cost cutting in the area of content generation vis-a-vis -vis journalists. The cost, the cost cutting uh, of salaries of, of actual journalists who are, who are doing the work for us. And this is a very, uh, while this is, a, is a, an unfortunate thing, I can tell you that the, the uh, um, item has gone down the list because the first year we did this survey, it was higher up. It was in the number five position. So perhaps it's uh, a, you know, a rounding error, but um, it, it, it is at least further down behind the major issues of printing, administration, materials, and all the very expensive things that it takes to run particularly print-based companies. And by the way, those companies that are participating in this um, survey are particularly multimedia companies anchored by print. So sometimes, you know, some of you um, are not in that world as much, but I can tell you most of the companies that respond do have multiple media operations. Um, so speaking of money, and we don't like to do that so much in a journalism conference, but I think it's really important to note what the plans are for making money so we can pay for our journalism. So um, here you can see in the blue shaded area, that's free for each of the different channels that we have listed here. The green is paid, and then there's a hybrid model in purple, uh, part paid, part free, and then there's a not applicable um, for those, especially newer uh, channels that uh, aren't as established yet. But you can see that in the print publication, we're relying on every, almost all of, all of the publications to be paid for. Website, uh, directly the opposite. Um, and then the mobile site and uh, the mobile apps and the tablets seem to have a little bit of a stronghold uh, going towards the paid for area, which is interesting. And then the last couple of slides just go into planning for the future and knowing, um, asking these executives uh, whether or not uh, they see a need for more and different channels of revenue for the future, and of course the answer is, is yes, but what, to what degree? So you see here in the blue shaded area, 27% of the respondents said that in the next year, they're going to need between 11 and 20% more from outside sources, not the traditional sources of revenue, but rather outside sources. So file that away in your memory, 27% uh, said that between 11 and 20 percent more is needed uh, from outside sources in the next 12 months. Now let's fast forward to five years from now and you can see that about half of the respondents say um, that they need at least 11 percent more revenue um, in the next five years from outside sources other than traditional um, media. Um, and so what uh, Significantly, 21%, the largest uh, portion, 
say that they need between 21 and 30 percent of their revenue in the next five years coming from outside sources that don't currently exist. So I think this is really interesting. It's top line data. We, this just came out a few days ago and we will have the final report at the end of the year. If you're interested in the full report with more detailed information about what's happening in country by country and region by region, please give me your card and write on it survey and I'll send it to you when it is published. Now, thank you very much. Now we're going to, we're going to introduce our illustrious speakers for today who are gonna give their views on what's happening in their own newsrooms and how they're, they're coping with the changes in the media landscape and the challenges ahead for um, their newsrooms as it, uh, as it pertains to budget and resources. So first, um, first of all, I'll, I'll give you the names of the people who are, who are going to be speaking to you today. Jorge Canahuati, the president of Grupo Opsa in Honduras, will be speaking to us first, followed by Svetlana M Miranyek, I'm sorry, uh, the editor-in-chief of Rio Novosti in Russia, and then Wolfgang Blau, from the editor-in-chief from Zeit Online from Germany, also will be speaking to us. Uh, and then we really want to hear from you. So after we hear from all of our speakers, we are going to um, hear from you. So file away some questions in your memory, and please do chime in when our speakers are done with their, their short presentations. So first, Jorge and all of you, all, all the speakers, would you please come up and, and, and join us up on um, the stage? And we'll ask Jorge to speak to us first from Honduras. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Martha. Good morning. Um, when I landed in Hong Kong, uh, I asked my I asked a question, say, "How what a big guy like me is doing in Hong Kong, participating in a panel, coming from a small country and small group of newspapers?" But here we are. So I'm glad. I will first of all I'd like to thank very much Jen for inviting us to participate in this panel. It's a privilege for me to share the table with such distinguished and respected individuals in the global media industry. The title of my presentation is Doing More with Less in Honduras, and I hope I can share with you our experience in the last 10 years uh, that we have tr been trying to transform and restructure our newsroom and the multimedia content production. Um, so you can um, have a feel of what our context of environment in, uh, for our work uh, is. I'd like to introduce some relevant data uh, of, uh, regarding Honduras and Central America. Central America is a region composed by five countries and has an estimated population of 42 million, which 7.8 million are internet users. In Honduras, the total newspaper circulation is approximately 180,000 copies a day for for a population of only 8.1 and with a literacy rate of 75%. National inter internet penetration is only 11.8 and forget about broadband. Ranking second among the lowest in the, uh, the among the uh, Latin America countries. And nevertheless, cent uh, cellular phone penetration is 112%. Therefore, it's much more feasible that our expansion in internet can occur through this platform. As October 2011, there, there are about a million registered users on Facebook in Honduras. Our, our group has three main daily, three daily newspapers, La Prensa, El Heraldo, and Die. Since 2001, we initiated our venture in the magazine publishing through our acquisition of Estilo, a social and lifestyle title. From that point on, we further delved into magazine journalism through other magazines, offer a broad portfolio that includes a variety of contents and titles. Uh, we publish approximately 50 titles a year, including Buen Provecho, which is the highest circulation magazine in Honduras. 
Then this year, we expanded to the Central America region uh, by the acquisition of Estrategi Negocio, which is a leading magazine for business, economic, and finance news of Central America. We have nine websites. Uh, on the, the, the primary three products produce 200 million page views, 62 million visits, 1.5 million unique users, and 12 million video views a year. And something that have happened because of the mobile platform that I just mentioned, our SMS news alert product, basic SMS product, uh, news uh, alert, uh, accounts for 50% of the digital revenues that our group has. We have about 230,000 subscriptions, 165,000 unique users on 98 categories. We have 300,000 Facebook followers. That means about 31, 30% of the penetration of the Honduran uh, registered um, Facebook users. And we have about 78,000 uh, tweeters. Now, in 2002, we started consolidating the, uh, the efficiency of our editorial group when we implemented the first part of the strategy based on maximizing synergies of the new, between the newsrooms of our main two newspapers, El Heraldo and La Prensa. Drastic changes were implemented that improved the process in the old newsrooms. There were changes in the organization and workflows, and most importantly, changes that added quality to editorial content. From them on, we created and maintained synergies, integrated the workflows, and shared content between the newsrooms, which resulted from with minimized rep processes and lower operating costs. As a key success factors in that, when we established the information engine strategy that we that it's called we require that the executive editors increase their participation in the administrative decisions while collaborating with our managers. Consequently, we feel that key success factors for the results that we have had are applying best practices and improving methods that allow us to make all the necessary changes in our newsrooms in less than a year the alignment of position, roles, and functions in the newsrooms on the basis of the new model was a crucial factor too. Both newsrooms have standardized processes. And uh, having a, success, a suitable editorial system that supported the new way of operating in the newsroom. Many of the benefits achieved has been focused on optimizing resources in the newsroom. The newsroom by the case, the newsroom in El Heraldo provides news content to La Prensa and vice versa. Many journalists and photographers of La, of La Prensa and El Heraldo's newsroom were promoted to become part of the other teams of the new units, which is the magazine unit and the, the sports title. The sports title is in charge of special sport news coverage abroad and shared information with all the other newspapers. We eliminated two newsrooms of the four we had, one in San Pedro Sula and one in Tegucigalpa. Those are the two main cities in Honduras. And the resources that, we, that were saved as a result of the new model were, have leveraged our expansion of products and invested in overcoming challenges on the propel, and to propel the digital expansion. Group Ops uh, process of multimedia content production has drastically changed since 2008. We have evolved from having an isolated department responsible for uploading the website to achieving greater involvement from journalists and photographers in the multimedia content production process. Before, websites were a reflection of the printed edition. Today, our website content feed from our journalists and are continuously updated through the day as news develop. Before 2008, our online audience were unknown, and so was the impact of our content. Now targeted audiences are clearly established and targeted according to a content plan that has been previously defined. This allows us to provide uninterrupted news, 
content online to our audiences in Honduras, to the Honduran community in the, U in the U.S., which is very important for us, and the rest of the communities around the world. As a key success, or as a key success, or success factors um, on this digital um, advancement, uh, of course, hiring young journalists, what we call, what it's called digital natives all around the world, has been very important. This has facilitated what we are doing in uh, face new in the the way we face new production challenge and the development of multimedia content in the, the editorial rooms even though we had had the enthusiasm of the staff it is important to highlight that a key element of, of obtaining in obtaining obtaining this result have been the alignment of the objectives and goals of the newsroom to those of the business unit as well as the reevaluation of job description and salary scales to, that accelerated the convergence process. Now we have strengthened our multimedia skills and 80% of the journalists, editors, and photographers work to create content for both our print edition as well as a digital platforms. A good percentage of them also feed the headlines of SMS News Alert as well as develop the content for our online television program. In the case of La Prensa in 2009, we had only seven out of 48 journalists in the newsroom that could send information to update the website. Two years later, we have 36 of 48 journalists, corresponding and, corresponding and editors. That's 85% of total staff. In addition to, all, to this, all photographers and upload photographers photographs and videos on the web. We produce with them video content, sports forums, the first national live news broadcast through the internet, live transmission, and much more. Our, news, our newest innovation, it's a product that we call DS Video Comics, became the most viewed video within the media industry in Honduras just a few weeks after its launch. As consequence of this of this 10-year transformation process, we are able to share with you the following conclusions. Convergence process takes several years to be implemented in a country like us because of the consideration of technology, training, redefinition, process, and functions, and implementation of new business models which require important economic effort from the media companies. There's no one recipe, recipe for the convergence. Each company should define its own model. The role of executive and managing editors in the transformation process of this newsroom is a key factor for success. Convergence represents a great opportunity for companies like, like us with multi-products allowing them to synergize, specialize in evolving the new multidimensional multi content information era. Our biggest challenge is to continue to strengthen these news content and synergies, strategies for efficiency, and continue making business while we transit toward digitalization without neglecting the quality of our print newspaper. The road to total multimedia convergence is more complicated in countries such as Honduras, that we have a very low penetration, internet penetration, but we have no doubt that the future is digital, regardless of what the access channel is. We have to keep strengthening our group, our group synergy through our different titles and products within the market segments in which we participate, besides progressing toward the total multimedia convergence. Furthermore, we have to consolidate the multimedia knowledge of the editors, journalists, and photographers within our newsroom and enhance readers' experience and drive the creation of new readers through the differentiated and focalized content catering to the interests of them. In the next few years, we have outlined a roadmap to continue with a way toward convergence and optimization of the resources in our newsroom. 
In 2012, we hope to finalize an in the implementation of an upgrade of our editorial system, which will serve as base platform that will, do, will enable multimedia, total multimedia convergence. In, that, in next year, we also hope to undergo with the implementation of the sports engine in which the Adio Diaz will become the main provider of sports news content for the other news dailies. dailies. And in 2013, we will continue with the implementation of the entertainment news engine, which will enable the magazine business unit to supply entertainment and lifestyle content to the other newspapers. Well, this is what I can share with you at this moment. We appreciate your kind attention. I hope this information will prove useful. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. And I, I think that it's appropriate to say that the, the kind of experiences that you've had are quite similar to many of the people in the audiences. The challenges that you face are quite similar to everyone else's. So, so thank you very much. And now we are going to ask Svetlana to join us on stage and to give a presentation about Rio Novosti in Russia. Thank you very kindly, Jorge. Thank you very much. Uh, Jorge, I was very much inspired by your presentation and let me invite you to be our special guest at the uh, Olympic Games uh, in Sochi 2014 with all your sport content which you uh, showed us in your presentation. Thank you. Uh, let me... No? This is the end. Yes, that's it. Uh, let me say a few words about the news agency which I'm uh, introducing. RIA Novosti is uh, uh, a news agency. Uh, it was a news agency of a very traditional regional uh, type uh, 10 years ago when I, 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 I came to the agency as, a chief, as its chief editor. Uh, and at that time, the uh, Ria Novosti was a, a successor of a, a um, former Soviet propaganda uh, machine, which was called APN. At uh, the beginning of 2000, it was almost ruined. Uh, there was no clients, uh, almost no clients, uh, lack of credibility, very poor network of uh, coll collecting and gathering the news. So uh, I would say that 10 years ago, this agency was absolute uh, outsider on a Russian agencies, uh, news agencies market. And at, this time, at that time, having no clients, the only possible strategy to survive was to face to the mass audience, what we did. And facing to the mass audience in five years, working with this mass audience and getting credibility back and getting clients back and developing uh, different multimedia platforms and uh, starting and creating new, f new formats, uh, we developed, again, uh, the professional uh, part, I mean, the, the, uh, the professional part of uh, our audience, uh, the uh, other professional medias for whom we uh, distributed our newswire. And at the same time, we, in five years, we have, we have beg became a, uh, absolute leaders on uh, the Russian uh, on the Russian media market, uh, the leaders of uh, mm, the leading agency which produced the news for the mass audience. Uh, uh, the last three years, we uh, aggressively and actively penetrated into the uh, social networks. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say that our motto for the last three years was, was like everything, everywhere, to, everyone, to almost everyone. Uh, this is the uh, model or the shape of the agency which probably we are going to turn to uh, the coming five, three, five years. Uh, the news network, we call it the news agency three uh, 3.0, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little 
uh, about what ways of uh, uh, changes we faced before and uh, how we see the trends uh, of uh, uh, the developing media landscape around us from the Russian corner. Uh, first, uh, and the most significant uh, trend which, which influenced our developing was the understanding the last, I would say, three years that technology changes two times faster than it was five, ten years ago. That means that editorial routine and formats uh, has to be changed or improved several times a year, which means that uh, we have to train we have to train the people, the journalists uh, uh, who work in our agency almost two, three, four times a year, and this process of training is already non-stop. Also, we notice that uh, the consumer behavior is changing also very fast. Uh, and we feel like we are now in the race of creating some new, new formats and new platforms to surprise our audience. Uh, we also have to, um, had to establish different uh, tools uh, and uh, um, to, to study our audience, to understand our audience uh, better and uh, to understand the behavioral, the psychological, the, uh, the profile of the audience. Uh, we see the demand uh, uh, that the demand for the traditional products like news wires is decreasing and at the same time uh, we see the shift uh, of the audience from mono products like text, photo and video to the combination, different uh, possible combination of the products. This is the numbers, uh, how the number of news items grew through the last five years with almost the same number of staff workers who are working who are and were working in the agency, 16 times more than it was five years ago, with plus 200 people uh, compared to year 2006. That means that we are in the lack of resources, not because we are decreasing uh, um, uh, the number of employees we are working with, but because uh, we are producing uh, much more items of the information. These are our forecast, how we see the uh, media landscape in the Russian corner or from the Russian corner. Uh, first main trend, as we see it, uh, is, uh, uh, we, we, we call it trans forecast, trans challenges, uh, trans boundary. Uh, we think that local language and uh, tr local language is uh, uh, somehow the last bounder, uh, the last bounder of protectionism for the local media or global media. Because in the moment when the quality of translation would give us not only the sense, but the style, not only the idea, but the uh, good quality of uh, 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 journalist text, at the same moment, uh, the local media, all local media, all around the world, will begin to compete to the global media with the same agenda. Uh, transparency of editorial processes uh, is uh, becoming the more and more significant thing. and the participation of readers in uh, the process of decision-making in, uh, in the editorial is also very significant. Uh, news are getting transsourced. It means that story is now a sum of editorial, social, user-generated content. Uh, and news are getting trans-tagged. The people demand uh, uh, more uh, tags, uh, uh, about the timeline, geolocation, context, whatever, and the combination of all these texts all together. Uh, we are not so much militaristic as uh, uh, some last statement of Russian government can seem, but uh, here we use the notion of war because uh, uh, I, I took the McLean's uh, uh, statement of the late 70s that 
uh, every, every new technology necessitates new war. Which new wars we have now, which new wars uh, reflect and uh, influence our strategy? We can say that they, they, these are the milestones of the cost-effective strategy which we are going to uh, develop in uh, uh, the nearest future. First, we all are uh, fighting for the mass audience. Uh, we thought before that mass audience is uh, endless. It is not. For example, we in Rio Novosti um, just uh, a few months ago recognized, understood that uh, we already has all the audience of the big cities. Moscow and St. Petersburg are all ours. So we have no potential to grow for, grow, for growing the audience in the big cities. We have to think about the penetration to the local area to the small cities and we have to think through which uh, platforms, through which channels we have to do it and with which content. Um, stratus, oh, wait, wait, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, stratus, quality strata in uh, different social networks is uh, also uh, a competing uh, item. Uh, influence and monetization lies on, lays on uh, the understanding which uh, quality of strata you are influencing with your content. Local content, what, that's what I said before. Uh, uh, I wouldn't surprise you if I say that, for example, uh, the scheduler of hot pipe cleaning uh, time in, uh, in summer, we have a routine procedure in all the big cities and small cities that uh, the hot pipe, uh, the hot, hot water pipelines, they are uh, cleaning by, by the local authorities. And the schedule of the cleaning of this hot water pipeline when you don't have the hot water in your house, in your household, is the most popular news compared to any breaking news, general news, whatever you have. Uh, UGC contact, we treat it not a threat. This is a cheap source of fresh, new, uh, and interesting content. And I will show further uh, the platform uh, of crowdsourcing platform, which uh, successfully was integrated by our agency into the editorial process. Uh, real time and life has become very significant measure, very significant trend in our life, which makes wire, traditional wire news by product. And I think that in five years, we will not even use the word wire anymore. Uh, and finally, the war for youngsters who are in three, five years of our coming future are the main consumers of our news. Uh, let's talk about money. Now, the main uh, uh, costs we have, uh, they lie uh, is uh, uh, in, uh, I, I think, in all other uh, editorials, uh, experience in uh, wages, infrastructure, uh, also in newsrooms, uh, infrastructure, and uh, workplace technology. This is the new room, newsroom which I uh, and uh, my colleagues, we created uh, uh, five years ago. Uh, it, about 250 people are working in it. This is the second newsroom which we uh, launched this year. This is for 350 people. And we think that this is the last newsroom we ever, we ever launched in the agency, not because of the lack of resources, but because the philosophy of producing news is changing, and I will show it further. What we think, we think that the main elements, the main cost elements, elements tomorrow will be the cloud technology. Uh, I mean the environment for producing news, com comfortable environment of producing news for journalists. Employee training, which would be, I would say, the main course of tomorrow, because we're going to train not only our journalists, but civil journalists we're working with, crowdsourcing uh, resources we are working with, and uh, uh, all other freelance uh, people, freelance sources we are working with, and research and innovation. 
uh, which is the uh, competitive advantage if you do have it, and which is not an advantage if you don't have it. Uh, that's the idea, uh, the fill, our feeling that the large newsrooms is a format of uh, producing the news already dead. Because the philosophy was to make news in-house. Now the newsroom is just a place of coordination of functions, editorial functions, which are already either outsourced or outplaced. Mm, and uh, the main uh, cost-effective element of our strategy, not would be, but it is already existing, the crowdsourcing. Not only in gathering the news, uh, but in uh, uh, taking the opinion and collecting the opinion, fact-checking, uh, and even uh, producing uh, stories. Also, the cost-effective element is uh, uh, reorganization or decentralization of the network structure, which is now uh, centralized in Moscow, decentralization into regional hubs, uh, and the freelance. This is the structure of uh, the newsroom of uh, yesterday, and this is the newsroom of tomorrow, as we see it. Same, but in a geographical sense of view. So, the one more element of uh, um, cost-effective strategy is uh, everything semantic, because it helps, uh, uh, it saves our time and the time of our journalists to produce the news and to gather the news, so it saves our money. This is the... Uh, uh, platform which we launched 18 months ago and which we ha successfully integrated in the editorial process of RIA Novosti. Uh, this is uh, not a copy mm, uh, of uh, iReporter of CNN because this is the platform where uh, uh, 200, more than 200 participants which are registered in it have already daily virtual planning session where they are not, we don't, we don't give them tasks. We sometimes ask them to find some news. Sometimes we ask them to do fact checking for us. Sometimes uh, we ask them to give uh, us their vision of, of what are the main news uh, in the localization they are. So they actively participate in different editorial functions of uh, RIA Novosti. In these 18 months, they already produced 6,000 news items and 3,000 video reports, and this number and quality is uh, increasing day after day. What is interesting, we also have uh, um, launched a virtual training center for them, so we, they, we train them. Uh, the most active, the more act the most active people we uh, invite to the uh, agency, uh, the most most uh, active uh, participants uh, have a chance uh, uh, to become uh, professional journalists and work with us. Uh, this is the format uh, of uh, uh, rap news. Uh, this format also came to us through the UGC platform, U Reporter. Professional rappers and hip hoppers came to us with the idea that the younger generation, 16 plus, they don't read, they don't uh, listen to the TV uh, news uh, or whatever radio news. Let's try. They, 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 mm, the idea was to try to um, give them the feeling, the understanding of news through the format they are used to. And we, together with them, launched the rap info format. I'm going to give you just a small part to show. Uh, we already have 28 successful episodes on air. Uh, each episode collects uh, about 300,000 300, viewers. The most popular collected 4 million viewers. That's it. Oh, very good. Oh. 
This is Abramovich case uh, in the uh, London court. This is a very popular format, and uh, uh, the youngsters, they are more critical, and uh, the, the news they choose, uh, it's absolutely different, uh, uh, differ from what we do in the grown up editorial of uh, RIA Novosti. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. I'm sure that all of you have questions for Svetlana and for Jorge, but hold those questions for now, and after we're, we're done with our speakers, then we can, we can ask uh, questions and have a dialogue. With that, um, I want to introduce our, our last speaker, Wolfgang Blau, and he was, is going to give us his presentation of Zeit Online. All right. Well, that was inspiring, Svetlana. I actually shouldn't even be part of this panel because uh, our newsroom is not shrinking. <laughs> so I feel like cheating, but however, uh, our newsroom is very small. Uh, we, we employ about 60, 60 uh, editors. We are growing very fast. Three and a half years ago when I came on board, we were about 16 editors at Zeit Online in Germany. Um, and we noticed that 60 editors, if you run all major desks from politics to culture to digital affairs to sports, uh, these days, because we assume that uh, at least half of our audience is bilingual, whenever there is globally breaking news, of course, we compete directly with BBC, Guardian, New York Times, and all the other behemoths in the industry with their several hundred editors. So over time, we had to figure out how to make the most out of our small crew, and, and what we learned is what I would like to share with you today. One qualifier, I'm speaking as a chief editor of an online newsroom. I don't know much about the print business, um, and I don't know how much of our learnings from the German market is, is, can be transferred into other markets. Uh, as I said, we have been very successful. We won a lot of awards this year, and luckily also our, the business side looks very good. Our revenue grows at a rate of about 70% over last year. We're not profitable yet, but at this point we are fairly relaxed that we will see, soon uh, reach that zone of profitability. And now that, that our success shows, uh, I'm quite often being asked what the factors of that success might be. And we think that there are certain structural factors that really help reduce stress in a newsroom. Because we have enough stress already as a small team covering the news, especially in these tumultuous last one and a half to two years, uh, so that we try to, to really X out all other factors that can cause stress or uncertainty in a newsroom. So what are some of these structural factors? First, the business model. I'm quite astounded how often when I ask uh, other companies, what's your business model, how I simply hear, well, to maximize traffic and to sell ad space. And I think that that is somehow an inheritance from print uh, uh, media, but it doesn't really work online. Uh, it, it doesn't really work to just trying to be the biggest in the market because there always will be someone who's bigger than you. Uh, in Germany, for instance, we say Spiegel Online is the market leader, or Bild Online, is, which is more a, a tabloid title, but really the market leader in news is German Telecom with T Online, or Microsoft Network Germany. Uh, so w we learned that we really have to find our niche, and instead of just 
hunting for a, a maximum audience, we are trying to reach a qualified audience, which means we will not be as big, but by going for, for a more affluent audience, more selective audience, we can charge much higher ad rates. And for a long time, uh, it was said that, that inadvertently the, the ad rates will go down into a millicent uh, range, and we actually think this is what will happen. Yes, the, the inventory is growing every day, and the ad rates will go down into a millicent area, but there is also an increasing demand for high-quality environments. And in our case, this worked out, and now we can attract these more uh, demanding clients that pay us a lot more per user than some of these very, very large news websites. And in the end, uh, the, the goal is not being the biggest. The goal is to, to do the best journalism, to have the most influence, and to be the most profitable. And that doesn't mean that you have to be the biggest. And if you can let go of that goal, you save yourself a lot of stress and, and silly comparisons with competitors that aren't really your competitors in your market segment. Second is the, the positioning that comes from that, is we learned that uh, positioning, editorially positioning a, a, in a journalistic product should um, consist at least as much by what you don't do journalistically as by what you do. Uh, the, the attempt to just cover it all, do it all, only dilutes a product and, and doesn't make you discernible in the market. And just a very simple example, we, we don't cover television. We just don't do it. Many of our editors don't even own television sets. And while we know that we could get a lot of traffic on reviewing the typical, the most influential political talk shows on the morning after, we don't do it. And not doing certain things, not covering certain topics also uh, helps us in becoming more uh, uh, distinct. Staff. We invest enormous amounts of time in recruiting and are somewhat fanatic about how we recruit, often interviewing dozens and dozens of, of candidates for one position. And it might seem inefficient because it costs us a lot of time. But we learned that for a chief editor, even though that is not very flattering, uh, we like to think of ourselves as people who take important, make important editorial decisions. I think the most consequential decision a chief editor makes is who she or he hires. And we are very, very strict about only recruiting journalists that dream of being online journalists, that have a strong track record already in how they use social media. And right now we run into the challenge that German journalism schools are not ready yet to train for what we need. And so we started uh, uh, looking through social media, looking, for instance, for German students at those American schools that we think are, are cutting edge right now. Culture change. We spend, I think, a bit too much time on trying to convince each and every department in our, corporate, in our company um, to understand what we're doing. And we learn that it is OK and that not everybody wants to be taken with on that ride into a new age of journalism. Uh, and that we should rather uh, invest into training the team that wants to be taken on that ride instead of constantly schlepping everybody with us. On the other hand, we also learned that it's important to calm those departments in our company who think that we are their demise and that we often very individually have to find ways for them to identify with our success and see it as their success, that they are enabling also with the revenue that they're giving to us, um, instead of looking at us as a problem. So we, we, by doing that, we also save a lot of energy and thus reduce stress. Innovation. Innovation, we learned the hard way, is a product in itself. And when we speak, for instance, about data journalism, of course, there's the immediate question, how do you finance it? Do advertisers want to be involved? Do they want to sponsor spaces around it? We learned that innovation pays off even if there are no sponsors and no advertisers around it because it, it invests into your brand. And we, in the beginning, were a bit over-focused on numbers when it came to advertisers. We learn now that advertisers also make gut-level decisions on where to allocate their, their advertising budget. And uh, oftentimes, there are many other sites that can offer similar demographics, as, as nichified as you might be. But what really tips the scale is how innovative you are and what your image is, and if they want to be associated with that image. And through that, also, 
so-called ORCID projects, like, like a big data journalism project, really helps also on the sales side with advertisers. Workflows. Uh, we learned that newsrooms tend to be prone to accepting silly and inefficient workflows far too long. And that is because, especially in these very busy last one and a half to two years, um, we always were focused on the now, 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 covering the next crisis, covering the next breaking news situation, instead of sometimes taking half a day with a few people to try to identify inefficient workflows and come up with alternatives. Uh, we, we really hunt for inefficiencies and, for instance, decided to use the same picture format, the same aspect ratio of 16 to 9 uh, for pictures, whether it's mobile, tablet, app, uh, or desktop website. Uh, and it really helps save us a lot of time. Another area where I think many newsrooms, at least in Germany, uh, also wasted time is, is discussions, endless discussions about their app strategy. And at this point, we are actually letting go of our app for uh, Zeit Online. We, we will not keep developing it. We decided to go uh, with a tablet-optimized website in HTML5. And we, we love apps, but we think that for, for fluid news sites, um, apps are too uh, somewhat of a straight jacket and are very costly and, and don't cater to our very fast innovation cycles. And we see code as part of our, our journalistic expression. And so whenever we, we do a, a data application, for instance, to integrate that into our app takes far too long. And by freeing ourselves from that, uh, we learned, trying to get that on screen here to show you what I mean, um, that we can also have better business opportunities because we can actually deliver the traffic on tablet sites that advertisers need. Um, this is our regular desktop website, but our server recognizes if you come with a tablet, not just an iPad, but also for a Samsung Galaxy Tab, for instance, and then you get to see the same content, same programming, but it's optimized for finger navigation. And we can do also the, the swipe gestures, everything in HTML5, you don't need an app for that. Apps, of course, have the advantage of the payment system, of uh, um, the um, news alert, the push alert, but even download to go at this point can be done in HTML5. So that also is a great efficiency that we could utilize for ourselves. User-generated content is another issue where we, in the beginning, lost a lot of energy because the hope was articulated to us that this would be a way to create cheap content. And we learned that user-generated content is not cheap. Uh, it, is, it is incredibly valuable for us. Uh, we greatly benefit from it, but we have to allocate a lot of resources and personnel to vet user-generated content, uh, clear legal issues, rights, communicate with users so that they're also happy and, and, and are being taken serious. Um, sales is another issue where, and, and this might be a German um, phenomenon, there's still a culture, I think, in my country that journalists and salespeople should not have to do uh, a lot with each other. And we learned that it's extremely important for us journalists to also understand the business side. Of course, we insist on what, what we call the separation of church and state and, and, and insist on a code of ethics. But it really helps both sides uh, if journalists understand the business of online advertising. And we actually came up with some ideas from a, from a very er editorial perspective. For instance, we, when we rebuilt our site, we wanted to reduce the amount of ad spaces on the site to, to get it more quiet. And so we came up with a very big ad, ad space. I think it's just booked right now, this space up there, which wasn't really being sold in Germany at the time before. And we said, well, if if car manufacturers are such an important advertiser in Germany or fashion, we need big spaces where they can really show their product. And we weren't sure if our sales team would want it, and it turned out that it was exactly what advertisers were missing and looking for in Germany. And in exchange, we could reduce the amount of ad spaces on our site and, and get the site much more quiet. Spirit. Spirit is a big issue in newsrooms. Uh, I think we sometimes, or at least I do, but many of my colleagues too, when, when we speak about this topic, we underestimate what it does to us to cover one crisis after the next. We think we're all professionals and we like to pride ourselves about you know, being able to just brush it off, but in the end, we really don't and it gets under our skin. And uh, all of us, at some point in our life, took this crazy decision to become journalists 
and later on in the newsroom often don't find that space to live that dream that we originally had when deciding to become a journalist. And so we think that in order for a newsroom to stay upbeat and, and motivated and, and creative, it's important to give editors every once in a while room to cover these topics uh, that do inspire them so that they can inspire uh, our readers. And so why not write more about projects, ideas, developments that give hope, hope for more justice for our earth and for equal rights of women and men, to mention only a few topics. So to wrap it up, um, if I look back, what do I wish somebody would have told me on the day that I came on board when I was very naive coming back from America after eight years? Uh, it would be get your business strategy and your editorial strategy in sync and free yourself right away from only aiming for a maximized audience instead of a qualified audience, which will be smaller but justifies higher ad revenue. Be absolutely ruthless. Do not compromise when hiring editors. This will be your most important decisions. Integrate at least a part of your tech team in your newsroom and make sure that your, your programmers get treated like senior editors. They deserve it. Treat innovation itself as a genuine product. It does pay out, not directly, but indirectly by enhancing the image of your brand. Hunt efficiencies. Hunt inefficiencies always. Never stop. It is your job as a chief editor. Do not fantasize about saving money by eliciting user-generated content, but do elicit it. Treat your sales team well and do everything you can to understand their field, their worries, and their competition. Profit. Profit is important, but try to be a company that is driven by a dream and not by the hunt for profit, and that actually will make you profitable. And if you want hopeful, optimistic editors, give them room to do research on topics that keep them inspired. And lastly, we at Set Online believe in the spirit of sharing. We learned a lot from, from very giving competitors, and so let us know if we can be of any help for you. Uh, you can find me online in all the social networks and, and on Twitter at W Blau. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, um, especially for that wrap-up, uh, that, that list, because I think that's extremely useful to all of us to follow that, uh, that structure. Now, we only have a little bit of time, but we want to include you in the conversation. Excuse me. And um, we want to know if, if, if someone had a question. This gentleman here... Um, could we have a microphone um, and, and answer any questions? And, and please, um, for those of you who are, are, are in the queue for questions, please think of some questions for our panel. Thank you. Uh, Wolfgang, um, I'm, I'm deeply interested to know your niche. You spoke about, you know, uh, uh, creating your own niche, uh, which means a group of people that have, you know, a common interest. So uh, what kind of niche have you chosen? Uh, uh, why did you choose this kind of uh, niche? And what kind of stories uh, you, you published to serve the, those people that uh, you have chosen as your audience? Well, when we repositioned Side Online three and a half years ago, it actually exists since more than 15 years, but it had a different task before it. The Zeit is a weekly newspaper um, with a lot of background stories, deep analysis, feature writing, um, and, and strong op-ed authors. And so when I came on board, the, the pendulum was always, when, when discussing future options, what Zeit Online could be, it was, well, let's build a copy of Spiegel Online, the market leader, a very fast news website. Or uh, the other end of the extreme, let's do something like the New Yorker or the Atlantic, Let's build a, a, an online weekly website only with essays and, and, and background stories. And while that would have worked in an English-speaking market with potentially billions of readers where you could still garner enough audiences to, to finance your newsroom, it was obvious early on that in a market of only 100 million German-speaking people in Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, you would have to offer a journalistic product that invites people to visit you every day or several times a day. So we said, yes, of course, our core strength also is, is background, is analysis, is, is more what does this mean when news happens. But on top of that, we also need to guarantee to our readers that if breaking news happens, they find out on our side as fast as anywhere else. But if we are in a more quiet time, we will not bother them with what we call news noise. And we see a lot of news noise in, in the German media business, and we will uh, spare our readers with that. 
Uh, we also emphasize uh, aesthetic elegance. It's a design product also. And we emphasize debate. We have very educated readers about a third works in academia. And their reader comments often are as good as our articles and oftentimes longer. Uh, and so we thought we have, to, we have to harvest that intelligence. And so we invest heavily into moderation and try to be the best debate platform in Germany. So these are some of the key points. And all of that helps, again, being in sync with the business strategy, attracting higher paying advertisers. Knowing we have just a little bit of time, please. Uh, hello, it's Amanda Wilson from the Sydney Morning Herald. I have a question for Svetlana. Um, I loved your rap uh, news. <coughs> and I'm just wondering when you introduced new and innovative ideas such as the rap, what was the reaction from the more traditional journalists who love their words and think they're brilliant? Uh, they didn't believe that this format would find uh, its own customers. Uh, and the idea came from the audience of, uh, the I said, 16 plus. Those who had children, I mean, elder generation of journalists who had younger children, they, uh, they thought that it uh, could make sense. Uh, and uh, those who, are, uh, who didn't, uh, uh, I would say that mostly they were skeptical. And even now, what I notice that uh, I find lots of people from uh, 16 to 25 who said to me, "Oh, the last, uh, the last uh, rap info was so interesting," and whatever they comment on this. And I also know that if I am talking to somebody who is 35 and elder, they never heard about this format. So this is the parallel world. Can I have just one last question, right here? Uh, my name is Sharp Kagda. I'm from Indonesia. I am a group editor of a company called Burrito Satu. Uh, this question is for Jorge. Uh, we have also, in the past 18 months, undergone a very painful consolidation. We brought eight newsrooms into one, uh, which has been a challenge in itself. Now, one of the key things that we face is how do we get our reporters who have been right, our reporters who in the past wrote for specific products, to get them to write across many products without them losing a sense of the identity. Because journalists like to write for a newspaper or for a magazine rather than write um, you know, into, a, into a basket and then the stories get picked from there. I wonder if you went through that same process and uh, what were your experience on that? Thank you. Okay, we, um, in our process of integration, we didn't make them go across their field of expertise on writing, but we, prom we promoted the cross plat the, uh, technological platforms. From, from newsprint to, to online, to mobile, uh, and to videos. So um, they're still on the, on the expertise that they, they, uh, their strengths are, but they have, uh, they have become multi-platform uh, journalists. And um, in that case, uh, one of our key elements were aligning their evaluation, uh, promoting um, remuneration scales that, that will invite them or motivate them to look forward to those issues. Thank you very much, and thank you to our illustrious panel for giving us such great information for our futures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will have the lunch with... Uh,